but because not only is this the Lord's Day, which takes precedence over everything else for the child of God, it is also Mother's Day, which is a very good thing. And I want you to read Proverbs 31, the privacy of your home. And think about those aspects of it, for it deals with the worthy woman that have to do with the wife and especially the mother. I think you'll find from the heart she is faithful in all things to her God first, foremost, and always. That she is a very industrious person who puts the home first and her responsibility as a wife. One of the things that she does, this is not talking about the father and the role he is to play as God assigns it and directs it, is to discipline the children. Now the first thing that happens when I say discipline is that you're thinking about corrective discipline. Because that's the way we have come to use the word discipline almost exclusively. But discipline means a course of action, a way to live. If you're a disciple of Christ, you're disciplined by Christ, by the instructions of Christ. So it is that we need to understand there is discipline that must take place before corrective discipline. Corrective discipline means you've known the standard, you've been instructed in the standard. You, as we say to parents, or parents say to children, and when we were children, parents said to us, you know better than that when we were in trouble. That means you've been taught better. You've been instructed. You have been discipled in whatever it was being talked about. So before there can ever be corrective discipline there must be preventive discipline i'm not speaking just of spiritual discipline regarding the church of our lord as the family of god and keeping it pure and every member faithful i'm speaking about the whole of society there must be rules there must be standards or all comes into chaos and anarchy <coughs> So when we think of the home and we think of the father, certainly we think of the head of the house if we know our Bibles, the one who leads and guides that house and all things, but especially with emphasis to the spiritual. But we're thinking about the mother now because I want to bring this while it is Mother's Day. And I'm focusing in on the fact of her disciplinary activity toward her children. I remember Brother Foy Wallace Jr. saying that by the time he was four years old, his mother had taught him to read from the King James Version of the Bible. Now to hear some modern people speak today and have, you know, they're greatly educated. So educated, they can't understand what Brother Wallace understood at four years old, how to learn how to read the English language in that old archaic Bible. The truth of the matter is we don't have mothers who will take the time regardless of the version and how accurate it is to teach and all that's necessary to teach in disciplining, discipling, teaching and training the children in just the Bible. Now I happen to know Brother Wallace when he was alive. And I know that he was a smart man, but I also know he wasn't beyond a whole lot of other people intellect. So it had to be that his mother knew how to teach him and realized her first responsibility as a mother was to those children. I doubt that that meant that every time she was ready to teach him at that age bracket, knowing what a four-year-old does, that he was ready to learn, but that meant that she had to stick to her job. That was singularly her job. Now take that and apply it to children and all mothers' duties to them in guiding the home. And I want to read this to you. 
Keeping in mind the assignment of Proverbs 31, I hope you won't forget it. This is called a living presence. I do not know who wrote it. But think about this. As we live our lives, as mothers and fathers move on in life. A young mother set her foot on the path of life. Is the way long? She asked. And the guide answered, Yes, the way is hard. And you will be old before you reach the end of it. But the end will be better than the beginning. But the young mother was happy and she could not believe that anything could be better than these days. So she played with her children and gathered flowers for them along the way. And the sun shone on them, and life was good. And the young mother cried, Nothing could be lovelier than this. Then came night and storm, and the path was dark, and the children shook with fear and cold. But the mother drew close to them and covered them with her mantle, and the children said, We're not afraid, Mother, for you are near, and no harm can come to us. And the mother said, This is better than the brightness of day, for I have taught my children courage. And the morning came, and there was a hill ahead, and the children climbed and grew weary. But at last she said to the children, A little patience, and we will be there. The children climbed, and when they reached the top, they said, We could not have done this without you, Mother. And that night, the mother looked up at the stars and said, This is a better day than the last, for my children have learned fortitude in the face of hardship. Yesterday, I gave them courage. Today, I gave them strength. And the next day came strange clouds which darkened the earth, clouds of war and hate and evil, and the children groped and stumbled. The mother said, look up, lift your eyes to the light. And the children looked and saw above the clouds the everlasting light, and it guided them and brought them beyond the darkness. And that night the mother said, this is the best day of all, for I've shown my children God. And the days went on and the weeks and the months and years, and the mother grew aged, and she was little and bent. But the children were tall and strong and walked with courage. And when the way was hard, they lifted her over the rough places. At last they came to a hill, and beyond the hill they could see a shining road and the golden gates, and they flung wide. And the mother said, I have reached the end of my journey, and now I know the end is better than the beginning. For my children can walk alone and their children after them. And the mother said, you will always walk with us. The children said, you will always walk with us, mother. They stood and watched her walk through the golden gate. Then the gates closed after her, and they said, we cannot now see our mother, but she is still with us. She is a living presence. Now, would you read Proverbs 31 as I ask and realize why God in His infinite wisdom put that chapter, the last in Proverbs, in that book, along with all of the other passages that have to do with wives and especially mothers. I want you to realize that there must be the discipline that is instructive. We must learn the standard. It must be learned not only in teaching, but by the life that mothers live. Did you catch that in the reading? 
the life that mothers live. Much of what mothers do has to do with warning. Now, I don't know whether you've ever noticed that or not, but it has to do with warning their children about this world. If you will watch parents with younger children, they're constantly on guard about where they are, what they're doing. Don't put that in your mouth. And that's a routine all day long affair. Nasty, nasty, put that down. Now, if you will enumerate those things and call to memory your own life and the rearing of your own children or being reared, you'll realize how many don't do that and don't do that. And sometimes children's next few words after mom and daddy is don't. Why is that? Because we want them to know they're bad things, they're not good things, and they don't need to be involved with the bad things. And there's a myriad of things along that line. And you know, God, who's our Father, loves us to the point He gave His only begotten Son to die for us. And the book, the book of books, the Word of God, teaches us about such discipline. Before it mentions corrective discipline. You see, here's the standard. I've been instructed in it. I know this is the way I'm to live. Now, if I deviate from it, then corrective discipline brings me back to it. And so all corrective discipline should be for that reason. The Bible is the most comforting book that has ever been written. But it's also a very disturbing book because it contains solemn warnings to children of God admonishing them to take heed lest they depart from God and the life that is in Him. And thus, we would, of course, commit spiritual suicide. You remember that Paul, in writing to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, was complimenting Timothy about his faith. Well, you know, faith comes by the Word of God, which meant his knowledge of the Word of God. And then he references his grandmother and his mother by saying it dwelt first in them. Doesn't mention the father. We know Timothy's father was a Greek. His mother was a Jew and evidently his grandmother was. But they knew their responsibility to that young lad. And so they taught him the truth. They took the time to teach him. They didn't let anything else come between them and instructing him. And Paul knew that. And so it's recorded in the divine volume to face us on the day of judgment. That's why you have Proverbs 31 that I hope you will read in the Bible. Remember the Lord searches all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him... He will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. 1 Chronicles 28, 9. Same sentiments are set out in 2 Chronicles 15, 2. Only those who have been born again are in the kingdom of God. John 3, 1 through 5. One must be brought to an active, obedient belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Romans 10, 17, John 8, 24. One must be caused to repent of all sins. A full resolve to break down one's old stubborn will and turn from a practiced life of sin to a practiced life of serving God. Acts 17, 30. Then to confess one's faith in Christ, that He is the Son of God, Romans 10, 10. Now you're in a state of conversion, ready to be born of water and the Spirit. To be baptized into Christ, Galatians 3 and verse 26 and 7. When one does that, the Lord adds him to the church. How many mothers are failing to teach that to their children if they even teach that the Bible is the Word of God and is to be obeyed at all costs? 
Now, you may be a fine Christian lady in all that the New Testament ever defined Christian lady to be. You have a responsibility to God, first, foremost, and always, Matthew 6, to be godly in all that the Bible defines that term to mean. Now, you may be very well at your stage of the game, educated in what it is to be a godly wife and a godly mother as much as the Bible can instruct and experience from faithful godly people can exemplify for you. But if you choose the wrong husband, you'll never be able to live as you're taught to live on the level you now know it. If you marry a husband who is outside of Christ, gives no interest to Christ, doesn't mean he's not a good provider for the home. Doesn't mean he doesn't care for his home. But he'll never have an interest in things of the kingdom. He'll never see his job from the standpoint of an assignment God has laid upon him that's his obligation to prove his love of God and faith in God. He can't help you to be the godly mother you've been taught to be. Or you say, but I'll convert him. Maybe you will and maybe you won't. As I think it was someone who said recently, that's a hard way to do missionary work. That means wisdom must be, and it can be, for God commands it to be, and he wouldn't if people couldn't be, even in an early age, who am I going to marry? For he is either going to help me be a good wife, as the Bible teaches me, and then a good mother, or he's going to be a stumbling block to me and doing all I know I ought to. And then your conscience starts eating at you. And then after a good while, you kill your conscience because you know it's not going to be any different. And you're not going to get any help. Because you see, he's now owning you. You're his wife. Those are his children. And he can do pretty much what he decides to do, and the Bible's not motivating him. Choices, choices, choices. And there are consequences that follow them or blessings. Consider with me when children come along. <coughs> And the book of Proverbs, I've already referred you to Proverbs 31, is full of material regarding corrective discipline. But it's full of material regarding the responsibility to impart knowledge of God to the children. But I don't know how many people in the church, good mothers, would say, well, yes, you must believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ, to be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, you must assemble with the saints to worship God as the Bible directs. You must engage in every act of worship. You ought to read your Bible daily and you ought to pray and you ought to be ready to help people and so on. And they may be able, possibly, to cite those scriptures that authorize them to think that way. They may even know the one that's printed up here, Colossians 3.17, and they may know how to apply it. But sometimes we get rather selective as to what we believe about the Bible and we fall victim to the same thing the denominational world. They pick and choose what they want to believe. Consider with me in the book of Proverbs, which is a book of pithy sayings designed to teach us and to guide us. Talk about discipline preventive discipline, instruction in the standard of right and wrong, and the details, and how you apply them. The book of Proverbs does a marvelous work in that, in day-to-day -day living, especially in the responsibility of the home and father, and since we're talking about mothers and mothers, and what they do. And especially in corrective discipline, which is a responsibility of father and mother. In Proverbs 13 and verse 24, he that spareth his rod hateth his son, 
but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Uh, how many of you have any scissors? Some of you need to cut that out. But if you're going to start cutting there, you got a lot more to cut. In chapter 19, in verse 18, same book, the inspired writer had this to say, Chasten thy son while there is hope. Whoop, there may be a time there is no hope. Chasten thy son while there is hope. And let not thy soul spare for his crying. Cut it out. You don't believe it. Well, I just can't see why the Baptists can't see that one must be baptized for the remission of sins, that salvation doesn't come before baptism. Do you see this? Same book, isn't it? Oh, but you come before Jesus Christ in judgment. Now what? It's not cut out of his Bible. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. Are those words in the Bible because, well, let's see, I'll put that in here because the book's run a little short. Or do I need this? And especially the parents. Look in chapter 22 and verse 15. It's the same sentiment. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. You believe that? Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Paul said in writing the great love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13 that when I was a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. You deal with children, you deal with them as children. You don't deal with them as adults. A lot of people don't understand that. You cannot make a one-year-old, a three-year-old, a four-year-old be an adult. I don't know why those verses are so difficult. And you have to know the difference between adults and children because foolishness is found in the heart of a child. But look what he says. But the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Now you're saying, well, I guess everything a child does is supposed to beat him. No, not everything. Not everything. Do you believe these verses? Oh, yes, it's in the Bible. I read it. That's God's Word. No, you don't. You don't do it. And faith apart from works is dead being alone. You have a dead faith toward this. Get your scissors and cut it out. But I love my children. You do not, or you do what God said. But I do. And I whimper and whine and I, and I cry over them and all that. Quit doing that. You remember when Joshua was on his face before God after the battle of Ai? And God had said, I'm going to give you all of this into your hands. But you've got to be obedient to my commandments. Well, Ai was a little city, so they took a small army and went up against them. And Ai came out and whipped him. And it just broke Joshua down. But he forgot one thing. They had already had the battle of Jericho. God gave that big city into their hands. But sin was in the camp. One man took things when God said, don't take them. And if Joshua had been thinking like he ought to, when God had said, I'll be with you as long as you're obedient to me, he would have known since they were beaten, talking about by implication, he would have known by implication, somebody sinned. And it's impacting the whole crowd. And thus we got beat. You remember what God said? Joshua was sort of like wringing his hands. No, oh, what's happened to us? Get up. There is a time to lament and a time to pray. But time to lament and pray or even rejoice and pray does not take the place of obedience to God's will. And that's what Joshua had to do is clean out the problem. And so it is with these verses that have to do with corrective discipline of a child. It doesn't always mean that every infraction a child uh, engages in needs a spanking, so to speak. There can be other ways of disciplining him. But let me tell you what you do 
If you threaten and 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 never do it. Expect trouble. And you've trained that child not to appreciate your authority or that you mean what you say and you say what you mean. So as the years pass and the child grows and you threaten and threaten and threaten and threaten and threaten and threaten until finally the child, at least physically, is grown. What attitude is he going to have toward authority in general? Respect on the job toward superiors, but especially his attitude toward God has had complete control of his life. And all he sees in his parents is that if I keep pushing, I'll get my way. Why does he see that? There's been almost 20 years of teaching him that works. And all I ever get is threaten and 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 threaten. But there's never the dropping of Hiroshima's bomb. There's not even a peach tree limb. First of all, there's not even a peach tree. There's not even a talking to. There's got to be something that says, you go over this line and you have violated the authority you're to live under, you've gone against the standard, and you must suffer the consequences. I'm not talking about being terribly anger. That's where the old saying goes, the parent says the child's going to hurt me worse than you. If you're really disciplining the child out of love for that child, you won't want to have to do that. But when you read the scriptures where God is explaining to the church, his spiritual family, that, that he chastens us. And it's for our own good. And then reminds us that our families, our fathers did that with us. To get us to do what they wanted us to do. Many times that may be the wrong kind of attitude behind the quote spanking but brethren listen you can't you just cannot pervert a wrong thing it's just wrong you may engage in it many many times but it's not a perversion the only thing you can pervert and corrupt is a right thing and because some people pervert and corrupt the right thing does not mean it still can be done rightly. And so these passages on corrective discipline. And because some people fail doesn't mean that it's still not there to do. It's still an obligation to be discharged. And that's very, very important to understand. In chapter 29... Verses 15 and 17 of Proverbs. The scripture reads, The king, it's in verse 14, The king that faithfully judges the poor, his throne shall be established forever. The rod and reproof give wisdom. You know, that's in a propositional form. The scriptures teach I could affirm in debate, the rod and reproof give wisdom. But, in contrast, a child left to himself bringeth his mother shame. I love my children so much, I just will not do what's necessary to get them to act like I really want them to act. Guess what's going to happen when he grows up in most cases? Guess what's going to happen? Did God know what he's talking about? If he did, do you believe him? The home is a place to mold children to be like they ought to be. Now you can discipline them correctively and not provide the other things that God expects a father and mother to do and that may not do much good at all because you know there's a lot of things involved in properly disciplined children in the sense of preventive discipline or teaching them the way to go. 
train a child up in the way he should go, and when he is old, not depart from him. Now that's not teaching you can so train up a child that you obey the gospel and he'll never fall away because no scripture teaches that one cannot fall away from the faith. But it's talking about training them to be mature people and responsible people and honest people. That's the best kind of heart to receive the gospel. You're helping them be prepared to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save their soul. By teaching them personal responsibility and respect for authority. And that consequences follow when one transgresses God's authority. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Another verse. That we can read it and say that's God's word and I ought to do it, but we don't. Consistency, consistency and steadfastness and regularity in evaluating the child's activity and all that it does each time is so important. But to simply neglect and ignore because it's tough and it just I just can't do it and I look pitiful and I whine and I don't know what's going on, okay, it's going to get a whole lot worse. It won't be like the one we read about in the beginning because she was teaching and training all the way down through her life. She finished her course. The children were what they ought to be. Now you must realize that story carries with it the idea that the children are instructable and correctable. I know there are children who are not. But I have a responsibility and all parents have a responsibility and the mothers certainly do. You'll find that in Proverbs 31, the mother who does what the mother ought to do, her children will rise up and cause her blessing. They may not do all of that while they're being put through the process. They may stomp their foot sometime and say, I hate you. Now, what is your response? I won't tell you if you don't know by that time. Only those who have obeyed the gospel will be saved, and only those in the church who abide by all the teaching of the Bible are going to be saved. We're sanctified in Christ. We're taught to be thou faithful unto death, and you'll receive a crown of life. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and he is withered, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. As the lesson is brought to a close, don't you realize the things that we've been talking about all pertain to what God would have us do in this life and is a part of being faithful if you are a parent? On this Mother's Day, when we all emotionally remember good mothers, if we had them, when we think of all the things that are important, we could only say that these are areas that have been neglected in the proper corrective discipline in so many homes in America, if they may be called homes, as the Bible defines them. We need to know the role of husband and wife, and father and mother. We need to know the role of parents. You only have one shot at this, folks. And those of us who have gathered from year to year and seen all of the collage of pictures of the graduates as they've gone by, realize how quickly it all goes and opportunities end. If you're not a child of God, we've studied what to do to become one. If you're a child of God and you're unfaithful, we beg of you to have an attitude of being instructed, of being humble and meek and repentant, and turn from whatever sin it may be that's separating you from God, to repent of them and confess them and pray God for forgiveness. God welcomes all of us to come to Him. He's ready to forgive if we'll do our part. So we ask you if you need to do that while we stand and sing.